Now, tonight's call, tonight's podcast might get a little emotional because it's two passionate people, myself and other, none other, my good friend, uh, Mr. Chris Whalen. I want to introduce him. Chris, uh, Chris Whalen is a CPA and for over 25 years has been the managing partner of a CPA firm specializing in tax and planning for families and businesses. He is an income tax and business expert, and he services every state in the union. I got to tell you, his website is Chris Whalen CPA, the C H R I S W H A L E N C P A dot com. We're going to get to know him. Um, we usually have Chris on to discuss, um, you know, tax season and 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 you know. Um, getting people in order for, for, for that, for filing their taxes and understanding, you know, how some of the laws changes change from year to year. But this was a topic, I mean, I could just put it out there and say Trump America, because people are still reeling from the election. People still can't believe. The pollsters, the pundits, everyone had it wrong. We have a new president, and it's not Hillary Rodden Clinton. And a lot of people are upset over it. A lot of people are emotional. We got people protesting in over 25 cities. Um, we got, we've got a president that, uh, excuse me, incoming president, president-elect. His name is being pulled off. His the licensing is being pulled off of buildings because people are saying either they don't want to be supported by this person, or you know, I don't know. There's a lot that's being said now, but I got to tell you, we got to get down to the straight facts and just the facts. We're going to talk with, we're going to bring him on now, Mr. Chris Whalen, because we got to get down to talking about what's going to, what does a Trump pres- presidency mean to, you know, the, the, the middle um, average type income family. Chris, how you doing? Good evening, Ted. I'm doing very well. That's perfect. That's perfect. Chris, I want to <laughs> thank you beforehand on taking the time out tonight. Um, I was sending out a message on Twitter, or a few of my friends and I were going back and forth, and it might have seemed like we were Trump bashing. But, you know, if you caught us a few weeks prior to that, we were Hillary bashing. I, I, I think <laughs> I'm like a lot of Americans who was unhappy with both candidates. I, I'm, I'm not afraid to say that, Chris. But how are you? I'm doing fine, and I agree that th- there really wasn't a very good choice for a number of reasons on both sides. I will agree with that. So I, what I try to do is I try to really get down to the economics, how is the country doing from a financial perspective and a uh, public service perspective, and to really see you know, where, where are we and do we want more of the same or do we need to change, and where are we really today on a number of important topics. I don't think enough people truly dig deep into researching things themselves and go with sound bites from the right or left and then espouse those as beliefs, which I think really does a disservice. So that's what, this, that's what we're going to talk about tonight, I think. Some real, some real important facts about the country and fiscal policy, foreign policy, and, and what, what went wrong with Obama and Bush too, and, and what maybe could go right either with Hillary, if Hillary had been elected or Trump had been elected. I, I think that's perfect. I think that's perfect because I, I, I got to tell you right now, um, I'm watching, well, you know, either we're, we're watching CNN, MSNBC, or we're watching Fox News. And you're getting a lot of the same from the left and from the right. And that that's how, it's, it, how it was during this entire campaign. So it's good to just hear the facts. And I, I kind of get the feeling sometimes that – we stopped hearing the facts, and we were just hearing the what was emotional for some of these people, what was, sure. you know, I, I guess part of fandom for some of these people. But I got to tell you, um, I guess we'll start off with um, a brief question that I have for you is, why did Hillary Rodden Clinton lose the election? Well, I think very importantly that basically more of the same Democratic Party policies 
rightfully scared many Americans who are hurting right now. It wasn't sexism. It wasn't racism. It wasn't white privilege. It wasn't a white backlash. It wasn't a white Christmas. It was very, very serious parts of the electorate are really hurting in a real way. And um, that th those are the voices that were heard right now. Um, they were really hurting for real reasons for decades, and they finally rose up and made a decision um, to make a change. And there was a backlash against Bush two and Obama. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm oh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. Go ahead. Oh no, I, I was just going to add in the fact that eight years ago we needed a change, or the country needed a change. So in 2008, the country needed to change, and that's when President Obama was elected. So here it is eight years later, and now President-elect Trump is here. Would you classify it or categorize it as the same change? I mean, it, it, yes, yes, it's a change. Is it a change for the better? Well, if we look at Obama... Hope and change was fantastic, but we really got a, a very uh, Republican output from his eight years. Um, you know, there's 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 many things I could cite. Like for example, the national debt um, has increased, almost doubled under his tenure. Now everyone in the country, including our children, each owe sixty-one thousand um, dollars each for the national debt. It's outrageous. That is. Um, I think, you know, that is more troubling and more dangerous than any email scandal or discussion about female private parts. There should be demonstrations about that, but there are none. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's insane to me. Um, if, you look at, um, if you look at Obama and his tenure, let's talk about the military. He, there was more m military spending under the Obama administration than, than there was under, under Bush. Obama is the only president, and they believe in history, who had active wars during both terms. So, um, if we, if you know, we had more, um, but but there were some positive things that that did occur under which people also on the right failed to discuss. There are some really really important things which I wish I wish Hillary Hillary had discussed more. Um, you know, what did um, like for example, um, over under Obama, our trade deficit. Our trade deficit shrunk by 24 percent. That's amazing. It's something that really went against um, Trump's view that all the manufacturing jobs had left. And, you know, that really is not true. And there was great success with trade under Obama. Um, illegal immigration under Obama is a, a serious win. Um, illegal immigration was down 3.4 percent or 9 percent, depending on which study you read. Unemployment, uh, 9.7 million jobs were created under Obama. The unemployment rate has dropped below historical norms. That doesn't include long-term unemployed, but still, it's a good step. The buying power of the average worker, the weekly paycheck, is, is, is up by 4.2%. Corp, cor, corporate profits are running high, 144% higher. So those are all, all tremendous positives, but of course, now we talk about what, what are some of the negatives and what was the main reason why the, the election was lost. It, it wasn't just a base sexist issue at all. Many people are hurting and were completely ignored by the Democrats, completely. And that, that's, very, that's, that's, exa that's the basic reason why this happened. Um, for example, Hillary didn't visit Wisconsin, for example. I could get into some right. specific issues if you wanted to. Um, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Hounding, go hounding ahead. the country. So one of the main things, health care, it's a very, very, very big issue today. And um, we really should talk about the nuts and bolts of Obamacare and, and just an overview here that the entire health care system we have is a secretive bureaucracy within an archaic business model. It should have been dismantled and built with total transparency and our needs first. It is really insane that the under, uh, it is simply insane that they tried to pass Obamacare without overhauling the underlying financial and processing structure. Obamacare was not set up with a true understanding of how the system is working. So, of course it failed. Um, you know, Trump wants everyone to be covered, but first the entire system needs to be restructured for true transparency. Um, once the entire healthcare industry is stripped down and made accountable and transparent, then we can make decisions about how to ensure everyone. I think that's the prudent way to go, and that is what Trump wants to do. And so I think that Hillary would have wanted to continue Obamacare, but it's failing miserably. I think under Hillary, we would have had really keeping it on life support, pardon the pun, 
um, for many more years when we needed different solutions. So what happened to Obamacare specifically? What was the what really happened? Well, um, Obama's care's issues are very similar to Hil Hillary's campaign. They ignored what everyday people on the street were going through. But if they had simply done some market research instead of being led blindly by their ideologies, they would have never passed Obamacare and Hillary could have won. I knew what was going to happen with the election just like I knew what would happen with Obamacare. And I'm just a CPA working in New Jersey, but no one ever called to ask me, but I wish they had. Um, <laughs> so what's happened is the millennials are not signing up, and they're choosing instead okay. to possibly pay the penalty. So what, why is that bad? Well, millennials paying premiums was the cornerstone of the, of, this financial, of, of the financial part of Obamacare to work. They were supposed to be paying exorbitant premiums for coverage they don't need, to finance the sick and elderly and lower income who can't afford the true cost. Of course, it, you, of, of course it failed. If you had really done the research about millennials and their finances, you would have known this would have happened. I knew it was going to happen. Um, middle class families' premiums have now doubled on average the past two years. That can't go on. Insurance carriers are, are running out of the system. Okay, but the number of people that were lacking health insurance has gone down by 15 million. Now, but many, many won't afford to be able to afford it any longer. So we have to do something else but still have everyone covered. I think my plan of restructuring with transparency is, 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 is a major way to go with health care. How do you feel? So, Chris, I, I want to stop you right there and say, okay, there's a roughly 22 million people on Obamacare, the Affordable Health Care Act. Um, we've heard an entire campaign from state to state, city to city, Donald Trump said, we're going to repeal, we're going to replace. That was the cornerstone, along with the wall and along with jobs and making America great and safe and all the above, again. After one meeting, one-on-one, -on -one, and, and wouldn't you have wanted to be a fly on the wall between oh, yeah. Obama and Trump? <laughs> one meeting, all of a sudden, there's a, a somewhat... Of, it appears to be an about face. Well, we're going to keep certain parts of it. it. I mean, is that even feasible? I mean, yes, pre-existing issues, and of course, um, you know, anyone that has a, a child that's under 26, that's still on their 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 insurance plan, um, is still would still be covered under this new plan by by our incoming president. But the question is. Do you, we even think it's feasible that they can rip certain pieces out? What is the plan to replace? It, well, it, has, there's a lot have, of... He um, doesn't have a specific plan. He definitely pledged he's not going to dismantle it until he has something to replace it immediately. So that's the important thing for everyone to know. Nothing is changing okay. until... And he said this in 60 Minutes, and he's, I, I, like I said, I read transcripts of, of, of things so I can know what people really say and not listen to the news mm -hmm. or the, the, opi the opinion outlets, as I call them. So he wants... He does, he's not sure what he wants to do, but this is failing, and he's going to reevaluate and put it to the people and... And, and so he's not going to dismantle Obamacare until there's something else he feels will be successful in its place. And he does want to keep those, those very important components, pre-existing conditions, as well as keeping your children on to a certain age. So I think it was a very prudent approach. It is failing. It's failing people. There are people now that can't afford it. So we need to do something very quickly. I'm glad. And I, I, I believe that if Hillary had come in, she would have tried to keep it on life support just to support Obama's l legacy, and that would have been a mistake. So getting Obamacare replaced with something else done, done the right way is very important. I'm glad that's going to get done. Now, now yes. I think that – go ahead. I'm listening. No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm just – I agree with you. Yes, if you can take the, the, the um, important pieces, I, I just don't see – how it's going to be dismantled without, you know, at any time. I mean, you know, you know what? There's much smarter people than us that are going to be the president and advisors of this 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 wonderful country. I, I just hope there's no point. There's a gap, and twenty, you know, twenty or so million million people are just left out there dangling without any type of coverage. 
Well, I think what should have happened and what really should happen is to give people respect and dignity is that, of course, it should be you know, strictly through, through tax collection and paid that way. We shouldn't be relying on millennials to, you know, to, pay, to pay an exorbitant amount. It shouldn't be that way. If you want insurance, you should get it. If not, but if you need it and can't afford it, the government needs to provide it to you. But we need to, have a, a real, a, we need to make the system as efficient and effective as possible. We deserve that. And then I'm willing to pay more taxes for something like that to, to make sure that someone who can't afford it you know, I've had a, I've a, a great, successful life in America, but we need to take care of our neighbors um, and, and bring that part of civility and dignity back to our society. So, uh, so it has to – everyone needs to have – we need a social safety net. We, everyone needs to be healthy. Everyone needs a safe place to live. Everyone, everyone needs to come out of the shadows, for example, if you're an illegal in this country, and it has to be done the right way. So I think that the approach to – for how it was approached with financing it was wrong. And shouldn't be handled that way. If someone needs insurance, but there should be number one, what what what's the what's the major problem with Obamacare? People don't realize that the health insurance industry is segmented by state. So I have Horizon right. Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey of New York, and my analogy is: Can you imagine? Let's just go to oil changes for a second. Imagine Jiffy Lube has had a separate corporate headquarters and bureaucracy in every state that had its own plans, its own advertising. And imagine the, uh, imagine the waste, waste there. And when you go to get an oil change, it cost, it cost me $50, and it cost the senior $3. So that, that would seem ludicrous to everybody. And so we need to nationalize companies to come out and sell to everybody and have real transparency. So people don't know how the system is working right now. It's not like McDonald's, where they're a national company with franchises. So that's, once we do that, then American people will really know what is the true cost of everything. Then we could talk about how to finance it. Things failed because we tried to put a Band-Aid on, on a gushing open wound that really needed a tourniquet or an amputation. So that's why it failed, because it, it's a good intention, but it's, but it's an uneducated decision, and, and which wasted a lot of money and effort and hurt a lot of people right now. So I want to go back to the question originally that I asked you about why did Hillary lose the election? Do, do you feel that people were more critical of her during this entire campaign? Because all we heard about was emails, emails, emails. You know, we heard about, the, there was, yeah, there was some dirty business that was aired, but that was due to WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, you know, possibility of, you know, the Russians getting involved, um, John, you know, John Podesta, um, with with his email hack, you know, why did it seem those last two weeks that well, people were all, more I critical? Care, I don't care, I don't care who exposed the information. So that doesn't matter. Okay. That's also a smokescreen. I don't care if if she dropped her day planner and we found out if if, if Putin personally got into her email. The fact is, it's good for us to know. Transparency is good. She 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 purposely circumvented national security. She broke the law. She put American lives and assets and, uh, and our allies at risk because for no reason other than that she preferred to be secretive. There's no other reason to use a personal server unless you want to have the option of deleting things that aren't backed up with the federal government. So it doesn't matter who leaked anything. It, it does, would it matter if, you know, if your wife was cheating on you? Would you care if it was WikiLeaks or your best friend that told you? Absolutely not. So let's stick the facts of the facts. And she did these things. So I think that, again, part of the problem with different supporters on the right or left, they fail to really look at the indiscretions and talk objectively about what their candidates have done. And so I like to do that. I mean, they're both reprehensible people. But if you really take a look at what <laughs> Hillary's done, if you look at how Hillary's been an apologist for her husband, you know, she's, she says mm -hmm. national. I mean, I know that Trump groped women, and that's terrible. I'm the father of three daughters, and misogyny is the worst thing in the world. But – she, right. on a high level, put your put your family at risk. Uh, so, uh, and I think I think that should take the same weight as him groping a Miss America or talking about female private parts when people think about who we want in office. And so, Hillary supporters will not talk about her indiscretions. They they give her a pass, which is wrong. And Trump supporters do the same thing. And people are basically sheep listening to sound bites and being being pushed by by their base fears to follow and of course I think I want a better America than that so why do you think 
I, and I know we're getting a little off topic here, but I just wanted your insight on why did the American people? It seemed like where wherever the scent was at the moment, that's what they were following. I mean, and and, and it, you know, it says a lot about a journalist about the the work that they did during this this campaign season. Not to knock them, I mean, because I'm not a journalist. I'm a blogger. I, I'm you know, I'm in information technology. You're in business and finance. You know, but I, I got to tell you, it just seemed like whatever the hot story was for the two or three day spin cycle, that's what they were going for, and the facts went out the window. Because oh, if course, you look at are, either no of those facts. candidates... There are, there are no facts. No. There's, there's nothing reported on the major news outlets that are facts, and I won't even listen to them. You know, I mean, unfortunately, the, the electorate is mostly uneducated, and they treated this like a Kardashians episode with no objective thought. So if this election teaches us anything, it is that the media is a biased mess propagating their own agendas with no concern for us. So... So, of course, I mean, I, I mean, so the, the electorate, we watched the Kardashians. So, of course, I mean, Trump <laughs> played that perfect. Trump played it perfectly. Right after he was elected that night, he became more presidential. So, of course, yes, he, he, did. Played a, he, he played a Kardashian-type person because that's what America wants. That's, that's the sadness. So, so he played it perfectly. He knew the, the country better. He knew their needs better, no doubt, and he knew how to get to people to listen to him. So, I mean, she lost the election, though. There are real issues, people, again, specific issues that, like, let's talk about it. The national debt, we talked about it. The Federal Reserve, right. interest rates are zero. We have no ability to save in this country. It, showed fail, it shows failed fiscal policies, and those trickle down and hurt everyone. Um, foreign policy, again, he, Obama campaigned for, uh, for, as anti-war. We're sick of war. We got more war spending under Obama. We don't want more of that. So unfortunately, oh, the legacy of Obama has a lot of negatives, and unfortunately, those stick to Hillary. You can't help it. So if you're feeling pain or distrust or worry about those failed policies of Obama, oh, that's Hillary unfortunately got more of the same and, and deserved to be. She's part of the party. Look what she did with Bernie Sanders within the, the Democratic, you know, within, within, within the party. Um, so that was, not, that was I, I'm going to jump in here and say that was dirty. That was dirty. Right. There was a I lot of dirty games real. going on. But that's politics. That's it's politics, real. Chris. So, so I, I, I know. I'm, Lee, I'm, I, I, I'm saying that people, there are things about Hillary that people don't like, even in her own party, Latinos. And, and African Americans voted uh, more towards the Republican side too. So there's real issues that people were concerned about, and and it's not just uh, I'm, I'm blindly following following a soundbite. So I think everyone should stop thinking about sexism as as this, and which bothers me. Like I like I tell everyone, listen, it if you're does. telling it your should. daughter, if you're if you're telling your daughters <laughs> that this election was skewed based on sexism, and that this was a setback for women. You're simply being used as a mindless megaphone for someone else's thoughts and agendas. As a father of three daughters, please don't make your daughters victims of anyone else. Take the time to truly research the very complex things that led to Donald Trump getting elected. The fact that Hillary was a female will not even register then. Having them listen to this interview would be a great place to start. Don't you think, Ted? <laughs> I would definitely think so. So, so what you're telling me is <laughs> after – are we, you know, are we really better? Because it, it's sounding like that we're not after eight years of President Obama's leadership. I mean, it, it, areas, at the yes. beginning, at the beginning, yeah, at the beginning of this conversation, when we got to this topic, you were saying yes, but then you started to hedge a little bit. So what, what's your answer on that? Well, I think overall it's a failure because his, 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 his gold standard, his, his main his his main campaign was wanting for Obamacare, and so that right. he he rises and falls on that, and it's it's failed. It was a, so he he headed it. He wanted to he planned it. His team put it together with Congress. So so that's that that unfortunately came to fruition in a negative way the past three or four, three or four months. But my my families my clients have been hurting with raised the premiums, including me, for a year. The sticker shock of a middle class family going from fifteen hundred dollars for a family of four to four thousand was was something that was just passed over. We knew that was going to happen. So of course we're shocked. We're not informed, and we're surprised. And we're we're, we're surprised by having to pay two thousand more dollars a month for health insurance, 
you know, uh, of, of course, the, 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 this, the, we've been duped. And so that's the feeling. I, I, have, I talk to hundreds of people on a regular basis, do seminars, talk to them, and that is the main thing that they feel um, of any color, any socioeconomic group, right? So, I mean, there's so many reasons why we're not better off. You know, Hillary is part of, is, is a globalist. She, she, she never talks about taking care of America first, as Trump does. We want to, our interest needs to be considered, um, and that's very important. And so I don't think – and people don't like that. Amer- America second or third bothers a lot of people of all ethnic groups. So there's real reasons why we don't want more of Obama, which would mean, which would mean we don't want Hillary. And so there's real factual reasons, whether she's a man, a woman, or a gerbil, why she wasn't – why she shouldn't have been real – why she shouldn't have been elected. Now, is Trump better? No, but Trump's an unknown, but Hillary's a known negative. Hillary and her and continuing the democratic policies are a known problem in many areas. So, again, 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 really, a vote for Trump was really a vote against the status quo, a vote against Hillary. A lot, I, I believe that too. So, as we we're watching um, the incoming president put together his transition team, and we're seeing there's a lot of movement going on, and I'm going to say to you the name. Um, I want to make sure I get this correct. Steve Bannon? Yes. A lightning rod nationalist. No one's happy about this appointment. This is on the left and on the right side. How can you say you're the man of the people, the man of law and order, you know, blah, 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 blah. We're going to do this and, you know, folks, don't worry. Give us some time. We're going to get all of this stuff and get everyone working. And you go and hire this guy. I'm very shocked. I think there were, you know, so people know he's he's uh, said many racist, very many anti-Semitic remarks um, openly. Um, and I don't think he has any place in any administration, especially a, a, a president-elect who says he wants to bring unity to the country. Again, this doesn't make any right. sense to me, 100%. Gotcha. So... I guess I have to go into what is the true state of the important components of our ec- economy and society. Hmm. Okay. Well, let's talk about it. Um, you know, again, we talked about the national debt. So, again, this this is our national debt. Again, now it's up to from about thirty-eight thousand, I believe, when Obama started, to sixty-one thousand of national debt per person. Again, it's. It's 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 so insane the amount of debt we have, um, and and it's it's our children and grandchildren that need to be paying this. So um, that that is terrible. I believe in a balanced budget. I believe in some borrowing, but I think that a balanced budget should be part of every household, let alone the country. Um, and of course, military spending has caused a lot of that, a lot of that issue since Bush too, even. Um, uh, like I said, foreign policy. Well, what do I want from foreign policy? What? Well, I listen. I want a strong, masculine head of our country. I want. I want people to be afraid of someone uh, that's running our country. I believe in some. Deployment. Well, everyone. I got to tell you, Chris. Right now, Chris. Right now, everyone's afraid. So <laughs> good. That's what I want. I want every every leader of the world to be concerned. That if they do something against us, like, for example, Ahmadinejad in Iran, he had something to do with IEDs killing our servicemen and women. We proved that, and yet he's still alive. So that shows how they're flouting any, any, any fear of our country, and I, that has to stop. I, when Trump got elected, the sort of the appeasing diplomatic kind of methods of Obama, which do have a place – were totally replaced by an unknown and someone who, who they, they don't know what Trump will do. And now he's commander-in-chief. And I like that. I want people around the world to, to have a second guess when they think of doing something or tweeting something against us. I want them to fear that our SEAL Team 6 is coming in. So foreign policy is, is a disaster for us. And the, look at the globalist agenda that Obama and, and Clinton were involved in. Look, look, look at Germany. Look at the head of these countries. They're now having similar problems with, with their own electorate because they don't even know what's happening. So we need a nationalist feeling, and, and the globalists were just bringing us down a slope the past eight years that is just we can't continue it. 
so you can comfortably say you're okay with with the incoming coming uh, president with the nuclear codes. A hundred percent. I I I feel well. Again, I don't know the man. Um, I think that he's hopefully prudent, and we don't know what's going to happen. I mean, it's there's no good choice. Do I want either of them having the codes? Hillary can Hillary lied about her email. Who knows? I mean, these people are sociopaths. To be honest with you, they will do what they want to do to serve their selfish needs at the expense of everybody. That's that's what they are. So I don't make. Believe me, I'm just looking at the lesser of two evils going forward. And so yes, I, I trust them. I I, I, tr- I trust them. Both, both as little as I possibly can, <laughs> with especially the nuclear codes. <laughs> oh my goodness! Good answer. I'm Good to, answer. I'm I got to be, I'm to be pra- I'm practical. I'm trying to be practical about real issues and what can they really affect. I don't think there's going to be a nuclear war. So again, that's a that's a big issue and it's emotional. But I care more about jobs and NAFTA and and immigration and and reforming that to respect everyone, especially the illegals who are here, and I think we have a chance for that. I mean, can we talk a little bit about the border wall or the fence? That, 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 that's, that's definitely, because that was next on, on, on my to-do list for us to talk. I mean, because there's, there's three common, you know, core pieces tonight. That's immigration, that's jobs, and that's health care. So let's, let's talk about immigration, because that was another piece from day one, I, I guess it was like September of 2015, we're going to build a wall. We're going to build a wall. I mean, it was like you heard it each and every time. Mm. He must have repeated that. I mean, I understand. Those are the talking points. You got to keep them. You got to keep it simple because you don't know, you know, who and what you're dealing with. But once again, after... One discussion, and, and I don't know if we put it totally on Obama, but all of a sudden, that wall could be partially a fence now. Right. Well, we want to keep up, but there are parts where it could be a fence, where it could keep people out. So let's talk unemotionally about the wall, and, and it's, it's not racist to want a wall. It's, it's good to have control of our borders, especially because terrorists can come. But let me, let me give an analogy that takes us out of the border wall for a second because that, that's so emotionally charged that people have a hard time being objective. So let's, yes, I just want to bring, every, I, I, right, I wanna bring everybody back to Katrina and the flooding in New Orleans. Everyone remembers that. It's terrible. Um, and so can you imagine after the flooding that we, we came together as a country to make a flood management program for New Orleans? We, that's what we, that's okay. what we did. But, but we purposely did not have a levy. So we have water coming in and out. How can we manage our flooding and our water system and our sewage system when there's no levy? You would think that's insane. Well, of course, the same goes for our economy and workers and immigration. That the flood of immigrants that could come in and out makes us unable to plan. So it's better for everyone if we control it. And we can get rid of people coming over the border, dying in the desert, women being raped, um, you know, drugs coming over the border. There's, there's no good reason for us to not have a border. I ask everyone, why is it bad for us as a country? There's never any reason. So it's not a racist idea. We, it's been a great disservice for decades that we don't have control over immigration and we cannot control our economy the right way. So now everyone can understand. Think of the New Orleans analogy and how insane it would be if we did not have a levy to control the water that could come in. Of course, we, we, we should control 99.9% of the water coming in. And then we, say, then we can say, how do we manage and, and a catastrophe that could happen? Right now we have a constant catastrophe happening and – it's insane that we do this, and I'm an economics person. I deal with street-level business. I deal with illegal agreements, uh, immigrants on a regular basis and help, help them out. And I want to say that there are, there are no harder-working people in the country. I want everyone to realize that. A large fallacy about immigrants is that they game the system, and, and that's really not true. A lot of them are on payroll, having FICA withheld. They're, they're, they're shoring up the Social Security system. That is the big phantom 
uh, thing that people don't know about. If that's why they're allowed to stay here. We need them. So I want everyone now, we talk a lot about bias. I do. I talk a lot about bias. But when you see someone mm-hmm. riding a bicycle, but riding a bicycle in the snow to go work at a car wash, this is a Benjamin Franklin level person. This is a Thomas Jefferson. This is this, these are people who ran the gauntlet to get here beyond what the people in the Mayflower went through or immigrants in the early 20th century. And so they are Americans at heart. These people are libertarians when I talk to them. These are – you would think you're talking to, you know, to Donald Trump when you talk to these people. So it will be better for everyone if we get rid of the criminals and, and, and deport them or incarcerate them, get total control of our borders, have a real immigration system. We need to make a system where everyone that's here working hard is brought out of the shadows, give them respect, have them pay their taxes, and ha- have, give them a path to citizenship that doesn't disrespect the people who have been waiting. And then at that moment, you purposely enforce the law – about illegal hiring. We have laws in the books that's illegal to hire somebody. We, when we, we could, the moment we put someone in jail for that, a few times around the country, there's no more illegal hiring, but we need to have a system that respects the immigrants who want to come and help us and work. So I think the wall is very important, just like the levees are in New Orleans, before we can really, just like Obamacare. We have to dismantle the whole system and build it up to what it should be transparently and control it, then we can make a system that really helps the country and the people using the services and or immigrants coming here. How do we, I mean, and, and you did a, 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 an excellent job in explaining this immigration situation with the wall and the defense and all the above, but let's humanize this situation because it's surely sounding like come January 20th, 2017, that the Dream Act database is all, you know, they already have, um, you know, the incoming team already has an access to it. They're pulling names. And, I mean, and, and, and excuse me for saying this, that they're pulling up at in front of every Home Depot across America and grabbing immigrants and th- throwing them into a truck or whatever the situation is and getting them out of here. I, I just don't see the process behind how do you go about deporting these people, at, at least in the way that Donald Trump wants to do it. Because the, the one thing that's not said, Chris, is President Obama has been deporting, I mean, X amount of immigrants out of the U.S., I agree. But, I, I mean, tell me, I mean, if you have any insight to, for someone who's sitting there for the past 18 months, wall, 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 we're getting them out, we're getting them out, and, you know, they're rapists, they're this, they're that, and some are good people. That soundbite has been played five million times. Right. I mean, what's going to be, what's going to be the plan? Well, I mean, and the sad that, thing about it is, we don't know the plan. We've seen his action points. We've seen his contract. What is the plan? What, what is it beyond that point? Well, he said on the 60 Minutes interview and other places, if you read transcripts and, and the real facts, he said that he wants to take care of the criminals and illegal element that's here within the illegal immigrant community, and he's not going to touch anybody else right now. And he's, he's going to take some sober time and, and build, build the wall and come up with a plan, a comprehensive plan that's, that respects everybody. That's what I've heard several times from him, and that's what I want to happen. Again, there's nothing negative for our country if these people are taken off the streets. These people have hurt Americans, killed Americans. So he should do that, and we, we should have a better vetting process. And we don't have it right now because the, the border is porous. These people wouldn't be here if, we, if the American people had had the right border done and the right immigration and the tightness with their immigration. So, yes, are, are people scared? I've talked to people, immigrant families, clients of mine, illegal and legal that are scared to death, calling me, seeing how I feel about right. it. And, and, and I, I told them this is what he said. I, can't, he, we, I don't see him going and rounding up people um, who are working here. Um, even illegally right now. He said he's not, that's not part of his immediate plan, and I don't believe it is. I think he's going to come up with a comprehensive immigration strategy. These people are needed here. You can't take 20 million people out of the economy. Um, I mean, I mean there's, there's no, it's impossible because we need them. Again, this is, I think this is a very important point that no one understands how significant 
the, the illegal immigrant workers are in the country for keeping it going, paying taxes, paying rents here. That's another fallacy you hear about, oh, illegal immigrants' kids are going to school. And I said, I said, right, and they're renting apartments or places where the landlords are paying taxes to pay for education in New Jersey. So they are paying their way to go to school here. So that's another part of bias. We don't even know the facts of everything. Oh, illegals are this because someone told me. No, well, what are the real facts? And I, that's what I try to deal in every day. I have to to give advice to people, especially business owners. So, you know, how does this imp- – I've, I've, so I've gotten so many calls since the election, I can't even tell you. I'm backed up with meetings now just to talk about how hey, this will impact them. Chris, has anyone contacted you in regards to, hey, I'm an illegal, but my child was born in America? So he or she has a social security number. Sure. I mean, I, I get this all the time. And there's a, there's a, if you, everyone has heard the stories of, and we hear it every day, just like Trump talked about the wall. We don't want to break up families. We don't want to be in the – and so, of course, the government should have nothing to do with your family. The kids should go where the parents go. And so uh, people get upset with me when I talk about this because they've been so – and it's been so brainwashed into thinking that, oh, a child's born here, and what if the parent gets deported? Well, yeah, but, but they, it's very racist and elitist, and I'll, I'll prove it quickly, is that let's say we have two, two couples coming from Honduras, no children. They come the same day to Texas. They get an apartment side by side. They both have a son the same day. The both couples live here for eight years. Eight years, the child's never known Honduras the child is Americanized. We all agree. So the first couple is on a work visa with IBM, and they, they, the work visa is up, and they get on a plane and go home. That, and where does, the, where does the baby go? The child goes with the parents, of course. Correct. But, but, but next door, they were illegal. They're here, and on the same day, they get caught and they get deported, going home on the same plane with the other couple that was working for IBM. Where does the baby go? The baby goes with the parents. So that is a fake issue. That is something that is it's ridiculous that people would ever think the government should say, if a parent leaves their child in America, that's their choice. It might be better for the child, but they're splitting up the family. We're not. They're here illegally. We have to deport them if that's the law. So we are not splitting up families at all. Parents are making a decision to leave their children behind. Now, I disagree with that. I'd rather be in Honduras with my mother and, of course, it's, it's very elitist and racist because I'll prove it this way. Let's say me and my wife go to Audible England. Audible is offering Wait. our listeners a free audiobook of your. I'm you there? S- so sorry about that. Go ahead, Chris. That's okay. So let's say that a couple, we go, me, me and uh, my wife go to England. We have a baby there. It's a British subject, similar to our law, let's say. And we're there for eight years illegally, and then we, we want to come home. But the government tells us, oh, no, the baby's better off here. <laughs> well, of course, you'd say, well, that's insane. <laughs> we're going back to America. So because it's, we're not brown people living in South America, it's a, so it's a very offensive, very offensive uh, line of ideology they have with regard to this that really takes advantage of people's racism. If it was, I mean, there are tons of Canadian families going back home with children that were born here. There are, there are French families. There are, uh, you know, again, Canadian. Well, so Caucasian families, this happens all the time. You never hear about that. Have you ever seen one video of splitting up of a Caucasian family? Never, because it's used against us, and, and that's why people need to do their own research and see what are the facts here. And so I try to – that issue bothers me so much because it's, it's really – it's a parenting issue, and it disrespects the people who are leaving. It treats them like, like subhuman. No, they're choosing to leave their child for a real, for a real reason for them, for the family, and that's a good thing to do. That's what a parent does. We should glorify those people who make the hard decision, who have to go back home but leave their child here in the care of others, who want the American way. That's, that's a great thing. We should have news, news items that show this and glorify them as they leave the country. So as middle America was screaming, <laughs> cheering at every rally – for our incoming president. So tell me, I mean, just the straight facts. If you're used to receiving services from illegal immigrants and then those same services are transferred over to a standard company, 
I right. mean, the cost of doing those services or the, mm. the cost of having those services performed, well, I mean, the percentage went up, what, 500%? <laughs> well, I mean, the agricultural business in California would collapse. I mean, we're only um, – that's why there's never been an INS rate in California, of course, because they couldn't compete with the South American produce if they didn't have the cheap labor. And that also did the disrespect to the immigrants so much. Um, oh, yeah, there would be, there'd be sectors of the economy that would collapse, that could not function, because Americans don't want to do the work. And so that would be great. I would love I, – I talked to the, to the illegal immigrant community in New Jersey and New York. I talked to leaders of that. And I, want, I would love to have a national strike. You know, let, let's circumvent the wall, <laughs> border wall. Let's go on strike and say, okay, we, we're all going home. We, we've heard you. You know, don't don't build the wall until we cross the border back home, then build the wall, because that would really show America. Wait a second. It would take the bias away. Right. A bias is simply an idea that you have not based on your own experience. That's been that's been injected into you that you have a thought about something. It's not racist. It's like, for example, if I have a feeling that a, a black teenager in a hoodie is dangerous, that's not racist at all. It's bias. I don't have any racist thought. I'm seeing a situation and putting a possible you know, uh, outcome to it. So that's what people have to realize. So that's, they have to get past the bias and realize that they're biased on both sides. So it's biased and it's elite. also profiling. Oh, yeah, well, exactly. And, but, but, but profiling ends the moment you have a real experience. So I, I liken it to this, like another analogy to take it out of our emotional sphere of, of, of racism or profiling. So when I was younger, there was a show called The Love Boat. We might remember The Love Boat. Now, the main port of call on The Love Boat was, was Puerto Vallarta, Mexico. So my young yes. mind was formed. My, my thoughts about it were formed by The Love Boat, Puerto Vallarta. Now, is that a bias? Is that racist? No. That was my only experience was, was this third party giving me information. So I went to Puerto Vallarta later in life, and all that bias goes away. The moment that you have a three-dimensional experience, which is why with race in the country, we need to do so much with that. I've done a lot of volunteering in inner city in Newark, especially with formerly incarcerated teens. And that's one of the best things about it, to have me come into a classroom, very Caucasian, and they immediately don't trust me because of their bias. And then we break down that wall, and it becomes a real learning experience. So we need to do more of that in the country. But everyone should realize a lot of this is bias, which is taking someone else's opinion and using it as our own fact-based opinion and objective thought, which is not true at all. <clears throat> Chris, how do we get the, the country working again? Uh, well, I think everyone needs to hire my firm, <laughs> first of all. I think that's the first thing we need, that everyone should become a Chris, a Chris Whalen CPA client. We'll get you personally on the, on the, on the, on the road to fiscal health. No, but honestly, um, we do need to... <laughs> we do need to be as honest as we can. I think that the cornerstone of any policy going forward needs to talk about the dignity of everyone in the country, uh, and that's not talked about by anybody really in a, in a truthful way. That we need to get back to our roots of a country and respecting everyone, no matter where you work, who you are. You deserve the, the, the advantages of being an American and respect so I think that that has to be the, the cornerstone, the bottom of our, our pyramid forming where we go and what direction we are, um, or else we're going to have the haves and have-nots. We're going to continue to have the problems with disparity in the country. And so if you don't address that major issue of the income disparity in the country and how the middle class really doesn't exist anymore, I tell my clients they're not middle class. You'll hear the, you'll hear the president and president-elect talk about the middle class, but it doesn't exist. And if I can just talk about that for a minute, that after World War II, middle class was basically invented. You had a, a, a father sometimes working out of the house, sometimes a mom at home. That, that worker out of the house had pensions, had a 40-hour work week. They didn't need Social Security for the future. They had quality of life and safety. At that time, when it was invented, people that were working check to check with other people watching their children with no pensions and no savings, those are the working poor. So if you fall into that category, that should make you very upset. My Italian and Irish uh, ancestors that came here to make a better life, if they could see where we are today with, with, their, with, with, with us, their great-great-grandchildren, they would never have come. 
That's what we need to address. The, those, that is, like I said, there's so many things that we have to have as, as a basis for any policy decision uh, with the, with, with the d- dignity and support of people, having the social safety net, but with having a social safety net, but make it so there's their disincentives. The, 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 the entitlement system since the 60s is one of the major problems in what's caused, caused these problems today. Um, and it's made, as Dr. King, one of my heroes, said, please just give us an even playing field. Don't give us a handout. It will re-enslave us. And that's what it's done to the people in the lower economic strata. And so that's the biggest problem since 1965. But that's another whole conversation. So we need to get together as a country and make sure, as I said, I know I'm going on again about it, but we need to make taking care of everyone and their basic needs with dignity and respect as the cornerstone of our national policy going forward. So uh, my, my, my question was on jobs, but – I didn't hear anything about from you about vocational schools. I didn't hear. I mean, that I guess that's what I was looking for. Like, how do we get the country working again when these corporations are doing these corporations that are based in the U.S. are doing all their business and manufacturing outside of the U.S. and okay. then bringing the products back in? I get this question from parents every day, and so this is a parenting issue. There are many, many, many jobs that are needed in the country. It's very easy for a parent of a 10-year-old to look and say, hey, what, what do they project to be the most important jobs, highest-paying jobs, 10 years from now? And let's try to push our kids towards those. We need to be practical. Just because you were a fireman or you were an auto worker doesn't mean that your son or daughter deserves that same life, and it's not practical. We need to, parents need to be engaged. I, I say in my, I have a book, Foxhole Father, The Field Guide for Fathers. I, I, I say it many times in there that you are the main educator of your child. The government's not responsible, no, no, neither is a teacher or a school. So going forward, going forward now, when if you have a youngster or someone looking at the government's not supposed to tell you what to do, there's many, many opportunities in the world that are booming, that are going to be booming that is easy to understand. It's easy to research. And if you don't do that with your child and you expect them just to go to college and, uh, and just then get a job afterwards, well, that's very poor planning. People plan more for their breakfast than for what their kids are going to be when they grow up. And so I'm, I, I do a lot of seminars on this with, in, in my parenting area with my book to talk about you know, being very proactive. So what about jobs? Well, we need to understand, as I said, what is the reality right now? Well, manufacturing jobs have left the country, but not all of them. There is a great need in America for technology-savvy individuals in American manufacturing. High-tech manufacturing is booming here and will continue to boom. So those are things people don't realize. So what's really happening? Where are the jobs growing? They're growing in many different areas. We need to raise our children. We should talk about college, too. So not every person should go to college. Not every, everyone says we should have free education. That's not true. It should be tough to get into college. It should be tough to get into vocational school. It should be, people should be focused on what they want to do. It shouldn't be the 13th grade, as we say. So we need to focus our children on the world, what's happening. We need to educate them. Don't listen to the news. Teach them. Show them facts. Show them studies on jobs. And, and parents can go a long way to helping their children get the right job in the future. It's not hard to do. Is that making sense? If you, oh, totally. But Chris, I, I, I've got to segue slightly and say re, a really quick yes or no answer. If you had the opportunity to listen to Donald Trump at any of the rallies um, over this past eighteen months, would you, yes or no, have said to him, "Sir, as much as you mentioned we're going to bring jobs back, would you please stop manufacturing your ties in China?" <laughs> Well, I, I, I like to, I mean, ask my family members. I love to expose hypocrisy um, all day long. So, yes, I agree. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's Kardashians. I mean, this election could have been on the E-Network. So, so, yes, there's no, and let's think about why. Why aren't there excellent candidates out there? Look at what we've had the past 20 years. I mean, President Kennedy was the last president to get a pass from the media. So you have great men right. and women who would not want to put their family through the TMZ world we live in. So this is what we get. We get Kardashian world. We get 
we get sinister uh, Democratic candidates who are sociopaths doing what they want to circumvent federal law and smiling about it, um, lying to Congress. So, so there is no good decision. I'm just a realist, and I try to say, okay, we have a pile of garbage here. Okay, and we're, and, and we're going to split it and have, oh, I'm, I'm going to get the Trump garbage going forward. That's what I think. We're getting the Trump garbage. <laughs> okay, so let's try to make something out of it. You know, let's be Wally and let's try to package it up and let's try to make it look good. Um, and so we can, but now we have to have true scrutiny. Our voices, some of them were heard, but 99% of middle class voices or people that think they're, that is the great area that, is, that still didn't vote. That is where the power is, and the middle class is silent. That, if they would rise up and they would really, and really talk about what they want to bring their values back and get their lives back, then, then politicians will listen. And so that's what I push. I said, get involved. Get educated. Write to your congressman. I am constantly doing these things. Of course, as you can see, I don't mind giving my opinion. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And, and it's a, a very val- valid opinion also. Hey, I want to take a quick break. And for our listeners that are um, listening to this part of the the show, want to let you know this hour has ended. We want to thank you, as always, for supporting the show, and we will be back next week. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook of your choice and a free 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash late night parents and choose from over 180,000 audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash late night parents. That's audibletrial.com slash late night parents and get started today. Why Audible? Audible content includes more than 180,000 audio programs from the leading audiobook publishers, broadcasters, entertainers, magazine and newspaper publishers, and business information providers. That's audibletrials.com slash late night parents. And this is Ted Hicks. Want to let you guys know uh, ways to contact the show, late night parents.com forward slash author forward slash Ted. So you can see all my articles or you can go to Twitter or facebook.com forward slash late night parents. I am speaking with my good friend, um, Chris Whalen, CPA extraordinaire, Website to find him is chriswhalencpa.com. That's C H R I S W H A L E N C P A dot com, and we're talking about post election. We're we're having a just a discussion on Hillary, the election, Trump, Trump America, and we had a great first hour. Really interesting. Um, so many different parts of it. Chris, I want to thank you once again for the the first hour of the show because a lot of people, believe it or not, a lot of the um, stations that air are, are our show, Late Night Parents, they air it in the 60-minute block. So I wanted to be, um, you know, obey their, their laws of what, how they want to air the show. <laughs> but, but I tell you this much, um, and as we start to wrap up, for our podcast, I, I, you know, you hit upon some really major points. Wanted to talk real briefly about the war on terror, what's being done, you know, the border, the 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 the, the mention of radical Islamic terrorism. How are we going to be safe? Because I'm telling you, something's happening next Thursday. It's the Thanksgiving Day Parade. But there's so much chatter out there. And, you know, these type of parades, and right behind that is, you know, the holiday season kicks in. And then right behind that, you know, everyone's going to see the tree and all the above. Do you feel safe being at these, you know, public events? Um, I would say I would say yes. Um, I think I have a lot of uh, law enforcement as clients, um, especially in this tri-state area. Um, I think they're amazing men and women. They do a great job protecting us. Um, again, the border being so porous, it does get me very concerned that a dirty bomb could be snuck in very easily um, and be traveling to any state in the union. So I would feel much better. 
I think they've done an amazing job with 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 some of with with some of the negatives that the law enforcement has to deal with. So um, I think that should be everyone's main concern about the border. I, I love the immigrants being here. I, I I immigrants are great for the country, legal and illegal. So and I'm I'm on the street level doing accounting work for businesses every day. So I'm concerned about. But think about it. Think about someone. We only interdict less than 10 percent of the narcotics coming over the border. So what does that tell you? We could easily have have weapons and bombs coming in here, and, and they're not caught. And so that should get every mother and father in the country up in arms. We should all be on the border building a wall. We should I would be we should all be down there with picks and shovels and bricks and mortar and building a wall because the government won't to protect our family. And that's not alarmist. That's just reality. And if people don't they, they don't think about these things because that that's not the, what they hear. That's not what they hear from, especially from the Democratic side, and that's a disservice that's done. That's why we need to – I really urge everyone, you know, I urge everyone, you know, to read foreign news reports from all over the world. You want to really know about Brexit? Well, read a British paper. You want to know how the immigration of Muslims is impacting the European Union? Don't watch Fox or NBC. NBC. Don't read the New York Times. Find local European journalists who write independently. You want to know about the border? Well, read about – Read about the drugs and what we do catch and don't catch coming over the border. Read that. There's reports online, independent reports. And then imagine those are, drug, those are bombs coming in the country, and we only can catch one out of ten. Now, do you want a border wall now? Because, remember, Americans wait till something happens. So it's going to happen. Then everyone's going to be clamoring for a wall. So that's, that's my feeling about it. I just want to run back um, in our – previous discussion that we just had um the one comment that will get me in trouble but i have no problem with saying it is i'm a member of a baptist church i've been a member since 1998 um i love my church but i gotta tell you something so it's almost 2017 and i've been a member since 1998 so that's about 19 years Guess how many times I've seen politicians come into my church? <laughs> Go ahead. None. Every four years. Every four <laughs> years during election time, they <laughs> they shimmy their way into my church and all the local churches um, here in on Long Island. They make an appearance. And that's regardless. I mean, it's easy for me to say – uh, it's going to be a Democratic candidate. But sometimes Republicans come in, too, also, and they show up. They might put something in the collection basket, and they're reaching for the microphone from the the, the pastor to say their, 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 <laughs> their piece, which I truthfully believe should not be allowed because you should only have that privilege if you've made an effort to make that connection, to come – you know, to a worship service. And this has nothing to do with it. It's just my dislike for some of these politicians and for what they do mm-hmm. and how they prey on the people. Right. And then and you well, don't well, see well, them they for put, another well, well, they, they, they put a very nice big envelope in the basket, of course, um, when they come in, which is all part of the deal. Right. <laughs> I know, I know you don't, don't, how it works. But, <laughs> but, but, but take that that nice envelope and spread it over four years. That's not really that much money. I, I agree. I mean, you know, the, I, mean, I mean, I mean, if people of faith, if look at the the eighty seven percent of the evangelicals, they voted for Trump and they came out in big numbers. And so that's also a backlash in the country. People are spiritual, yet there's the, the liberals, liberals especially, have wanted to secularize the world. You someone talking about God? I'm, I believe in God. Um, um, pray every day. And for people are almost afraid to mention that in certain circles. It, it's it's insane. Sure. So I think I think the country needs that. That's been a tragedy in the country. The the loss of of, of faith and religion and a greater purpose to your life. Um, that's why the people are so lost. That's why youth are lost. There's so many youth that are look, look at how we've had this uh, a regression in p in 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 in, the, in people in their teens and twenties and where they are today as opposed to the same same age group 20 years ago. They're getting married later. They're, they're getting professions later. Part of that is a lack of direction, a lack of purpose, and nothing's better than being in church or, or synagogue um, and being part of, I love that as a youth, going to church and having being part of a 
part of a religious community uh, was one of the and going to a, I went to a Catholic school for twelve years um, was one of the best okay. things my parents ever did for me. I want to shift gears and let's talk taxes. This is your sweet spot. How is <laughs> Donald Trump's tax plan going to help? You know the average family. Well, first I want to start off by saying that that all of the people on the left were 100 percent right if Trump got ele- Trump got elected, because the um, Trump's plan will dramatically reduce taxes on high income taxpayers. Dramatically across the board helps them more than anybody. So that's true based on what I hear, the facts I have now about what his proposals are. So that is true. If any, so any, anyone can – that's a fact you heard tonight. You can be angry about that tomorrow if you want because that's true. <laughs> um, so <laughs> the, the basic logic of his plan is that if we decrease taxes and we reduce business restrictions, that means more business, more wages, more personal spending, and so tax re- revenues will actually increase. Well, we'll see. So that's the basic logic of his reduction in taxes. Um, so now how will – Let's talk about um, here, for example, a single, a single wage, a single person earning between 102,000 and 130,000, hypothetically in my example, they'll save about 3% in tax. Their, their rate, their effective rate, their bracket will go from 28% to 25%. So that's a real difference. I, I analyzed it today with real information and, um, and applied the new law, what Trump would be. That's one. Um, a ma- married filing joint couple earning between 170,000 and 250,000, common situation sometimes. They would save three to eight percent. Okay. Now it's now lower income though. A family earning between 40 and 50,000 a year would get a cut of only about 600 dollars if they didn't have any child care. That's it. That's that's uh, that's really true. Now, a family earning 50,000 dollars, but their child care costs are seven or eight thousand. They're going, to save, uh, they're going to save about 35% within their bracket. So if you do have children um, and you do have child care, that is going to give you even a more substantial benefit today under Trump than it would if, you, if, you, if, you, if Trump wasn't elected. So that's a very – because a lot of people do have child care. Most families right. do have a child, child care. So, so overall, for, for lower-income families, it will be, it'll be a, a tax benefit, not, but a lot of them aren't paying tax at all. A lot of people are, are under a certain income, don't pay income tax at all. So um, there, I think that it's, again, if you, if you were to look at my client base and apply, apply these plans directly to it, I would see a much greater dollar and percentage savings. So sometimes we get, people get mixed up between what, what percentage of what dollar. No, they, they, will, they will, dollar for dollar, Pro rata, they will get a greater savings the more money you make, and that's something that is a big problem, of course, for the country. And I, I disagree with it. I, I, I disagree with it to the extent that it was done, or, or will be done if it's passed. Okay. Because I okay. think we need to balance the budget. We need to people have you know we need to balance the budget again. This is similar to the wall. It's similar to dismantling Obamacare. Well, we have to get out of this. This this uh, this borrowing pattern to really normalize where we are. So to reduce taxes right now, when we have all this debt, sixty one thousand per person, is really not a prudent measure. We can do other things to to raise revenue and increase jobs, but to raise to decrease taxes now on the if come of getting a benefit. Well, when we have such deficits, that is that that is not a good move for the country. Okay. Makes sense. Um, it makes sense. Um, I want to touch on a very touchy topic that it's going to get both of us in trouble. Uh oh, is it, is is it my weight? No, it's not my <laughs> weight. It's something else. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> very, very touchy. Where we where we've t- touched upon um, health care. We've touched upon um, you know taxes. Jobs, immigration. We've talked to, about terrorism. Why do? Why is it that men want to discuss all the time about what a woman can and cannot do with her body? 
Well, it's interesting. I, I, I summarize the abortion issue to this. If a man could get pregnant, it'd be free and legal and available in every bar. So right. there's no way a man would ever accept a restriction. So it is, it is a very sexist issue to me and always has been. Um, I think it's a woman's right to choose what happens with her body. I think, though, if uh, I think abortion should not be allowed if a baby is viable. That means it's a, it's a person to me at conception. But when a, a child is viable, uh, a child can live outside the womb. It should be able to do that and have life. So um, up until that point, then I, abortion should be legal, and that baby is dependent on the mother and cannot live without her. So the mother's rights and it has, to, has to trump um, has to trump that, that, that baby's uh, life. I know it's a hard issue, but I, I have to give it to a U.S. citizen and respect the woman. Again, if a man could get pregnant, he would allow no restriction on himself. I know that. So um, I think that what's interesting is that what people don't realize, going with my last thought, that if a baby is viable out of the womb, we should save it. Everyone agrees on that. We don't want any late uh, last mm-hmm. trimester but, uh, but, but technology yeah. is advancing. There's going to come a time when we can – that fertilized egg can be gestated in an artificial womb. So that's going to be the main issue. So that, that's, this is going to become if, – if we go by the logic that a, a human life, if it can be sustained outside of a mother, has to be saved and should be, well, then we're going to come pretty soon in the next 10, 12 years to having an artificial environment that even a newly fertilized egg can grow in. Then what do we do? Then okay, you don't want that. You don't want this baby inside of you, and we, we so we want to take care of it. We can. So that's going to be not an abortion. It's going to be a transfer. So Planned Parenthood becomes an embryo tran, tr- transfer station, which is that's it. So that's another. So people should be thinking. This is what's going to happen. Then what do we do? Do you do you have the baby? Uh, you know, do, can a woman say, oh well, well you can't say in the last trimester I wanted I don't want the baby. Of course, that's unheard of, but now we have the same thing. Is this little bundle of cells something that we can take and take care of? So it's, in, so, you know, it's, it's a very interesting topic, but should be legal. That's my opinion. But I'm, I'm God-fearing. I think, it's mur- I think it's a murder. I think it's a life at conception. I believe God gives a soul to um, every fertilized egg um, at conception. I believe that. So, um, um, But, again, we have to separate the religious thought from – from the political and so not everyone is god fearing i have my beliefs and so your rights as an adult american need to trump any fetus inside of you up to a certain point the one feeling we get come i mean it it doesn't even have to wait until um the the january 20th 2017 that the Republicans are going to defund Planned Parenthood. What's your take on that? Well, I think that uh, that would be a shame. I think I know there's been some negative videos of them, the Jim O'Keefe stuff, but of course that's just sound bites. Planned Parenthood does such great education and and takes care of the health of women in such a great way that it would be such a loss to communities I can't imagine. Um, so um, they, I've, I've done work with them in the past, uh, uh, you know, volunteered over the years at different places. Um, so, yes, that would, be, that, would be, that would be wrong. Again, it's injecting their, their beliefs um, as Christians, right. which are important. But, again, this is a separation of church and state issue. You, you shouldn't bring that into. You should be non-religious when thinking about your your platform, thinking about what you'll defund. So that's my feeling. Planned Parenthood is very, very important to many, many families and women across the country. And if it's lost, it'd be a tremendous loss and a setback. Uh, Vice President-elect Mike Pence, um, and I'll just say this this term: conversion therapy. Right. I, I, I'm, I'm at all. Yeah, well, that's interesting. When people talk about how do I feel about um, our, of course, gays are born that way. It's just like I tell everyone, listen, I was born and I hate mint chocolate chip ice cream. I hate it. Now, I think Mike Pence would want to send me away to conversion therapy to like it. And you'd say that's insane. <laughs> of course, I, I'm not going to like it. You could brainwash me into believing. Right. But so, so no, it's, 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 it's. It's 
sexual orientation is what you're born with. Now, do I think there are people on both sides? Do I think there are people who believe they're gay or heterosexual? Or I think it's more often where heterosexuals are brought up in environments where, that are so anti-gay that they repress it, which is sad. So uh, I think that – but I think that sexual orientation is brought up much too much. Like your boss should never know if you're gay. It, it, it has nothing to do with your job. So when people say they were fired because they were gay, I'm like, well, how did your boss know? You know, so I think that too many people have a status update mentality when it comes to their orientation, their ethnicity, what they had for breakfast. So it doesn't – if you work for me, for example, there's no political, religious, or sexual talk allowed in my office. It has nothing to do with you making me money and servicing my clients. Talk about it later. So I think people – you don't. Ha- I don't have to be proud that I'm Irish or heterosexual or five foot ten. So – just come and do your job, and people don't have to accept what you do. This goes to the points about personal lives. Does Donald Trump's personal peccadilloes, should that impact his ability to be president? No. It has nothing to do with his ability. Just like imagine if you were scrutinized before a job on everything you ever did, and, and, and they knew about it. And so you didn't get the job. You'd say, that's ridiculous. Exactly. So I know he's president. I know it's an office, but still we can't we, – we have to ignore that to a certain extent because we could have a great commander-in-chief that has some negatives. Thomas Jefferson, great American. He owned slaves. Thank God he formed the country. So I think that, again, my, you asked the question. I, I have many gay friends, many gay clients. Um, I, 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 it doesn't matter to me. I just want, I want them to have healthy sexual romantic relationships. That's my concern about everybody. <laughs> you have a partner? Are mm. you happy? Are your, needs, are your needs being met? Whether it's a woman, a man, or you're a man or a woman, it doesn't matter to me. It's a personal choice, and everyone has to find their happiness, and that's what America is based on. I have no right to tell someone or judge them on who they're sleeping with. It's not bothering me. That's not in my bedroom, and I, I, I wish them all happiness in the world for two consenting adults to do what they want, whether it be archery, making love, or going out for breakfast. <sighs> Chris, we want to close up. This has been a, a great discussion. Uh, one of the first of many like this, where you could just be unfiltered and you come on to our show and just you just let loose. I want to just discuss <laughs> with you real briefly some of the initiatives that you're working on for 2017. Well, uh, big. Uh, I'm working on another book I mentioned earlier, um, Foxhole Father, The Field Guide for Business. It's available on Amazon. It's a, a book about fathering um, that I wrote really for my daughters. And uh, it really, my parenting philosophy uh, is that a man should be the masculine but non judgmental sanctuary for his children. And this book really applies that philosophy to many different parenting situations. Um, I'm working on I'm working on a business book called Foxhole Business, which will definitely be out by next summer. Um, so I'm working on that, which I'm very excited about. Um, I have you know just normal business plans. Um, my firm continues to expand um, thanks to uh, the uh, the clients that that are coming and and have a lot of um, allegiance to me, and they 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 refer their friends. Um, my 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 oldest daughter is getting married next summer. That's the biggest thing. Uh, she's getting married in July uh, to a, gr- a great young man who happens to be a CPA. Um, I just all I could say is um, <laughs> I, I I I I endorse that. I I like that a lot. And um, no, but it's just great things happening. I I'm a very fortunate individual living in America. Um, I know that I have great opportunity, and I really try in my daily life to just try to help people as much as I can with my experience and skill set and um and help them build wealth and build a happier life um and not just work for a living but really have a goal to enhance their life and their families' lives in many ways. So and I, I so appreciate you having these discussions and letting me come on come on and speak about things because I have these discussions one on one every day. And my clients believe me, they will ask me everything. They want my opinion um, on everything. So all of these issues are things I talk about every day. People want to know my informed opinion, and that I feel the best about. People feel I'm informed and objective about what I talk about, and I'm educated about it, and I'm proud about that the most, that they know me. I'm not coming from a partisan position. I'm trying to come from an educated position first and then apply my morals to that to see if it's the best way to go. i, I got to tell you, Chris, you've been on our show I think maybe four times. 
in the mm. last two and a half years, and each time you bring something different. That's that's <laughs> the best thing about it. It's 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 the different angles that you come from, but mostly you come from the heart. I I can that's just one thing that I I believe has drawn me to you and 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 also to your journey. The fact that you know you talk about it. The way you talk about it is how you see it, and you could be talking with anyone. It wouldn't matter mm. what the race of the person is, what the, their 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 financial background is. You're there. You're gonna give it your best, and and that's that when it comes down to business. Right. So I mean, I I, I can only hope that more people that will hear this podcast and as we put it on iHeartRadio and we distribute it out. That more people are like this But also when we do Distribute this thing out I want you to once again um, Plug Where they should call What website they should go to If they, anyone wants to call you and, and you know Further this discussion Well thank you and um, I would love to hear from everyone And, and thanks everyone so much for listening um, if you simply search for me, search for Chris Whalen CPA, that's W-H-A-L-E-N, uh, you'll definitely find me on my website. I, I come up around the world um, on the top of any search. Um, you'll see my website. You'll see my picture. Um, so please go to my website. My contact information is there. Uh, there's a button right in the front to ask me a tax question or contact me, so click that button. Um, I'm definitely here for all the late-night parents, the, the, the listeners. I've, I've dealt with a lot of you. I've gotten a lot of you as clients. I appreciate it. Um, again, I have a full-service CPA firm and business consulting firm. I would love to support you and your family and your business going forward through this ever-changing economic landscape. That's what I'm here for. Perfect. Chris, I want to give you one time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Chris, you and I will be working together again in the the very near future because, like I said, it's discussions like this that that bring that do bring people together, and for people to get you know the true meaning of what's happening out there, and they're not being caught up in a soundbite, because I tell you, for 18 months, that's all it was. I don't know about you, I had to turn off Fox and CNN and and, and MSNBC. I had to shut it off. It was just too much. So and and that was. Some of the stuff that we were discussing um, last Sunday with the election stress disorder, um, like I said, we plan to continue to have these discussions as we lean towards um, Inauguration Day and our president-elect. And I say you might not agree with him. You not, might not agree with what you've seen on TV, his, his, some of his mannerisms, but we do have to give him a chance. Yes, I know we're not happy with Bannon and we're not happy with some of his transition team members, but, hey, he's going to be the leader of the free world. We support him, and we support him until we can't support him. Let's put I it agree, that way. 100%. Regardless, you got to give him a chance. I want to thank you once again for joining us, and we will be talking in the very near future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ted. Have a great night. You too.